Hello, uh, my name is Christian Mortner. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield. And in my presentation, I will talk about a new approach to understand pain in people with dementia. Um, today's presentation uh, goes back to a number of research projects that have been conducted over the past few years, um, some of which were funded by funding institutions like the uh, AIUK or were in collaboration. Uh, with uh, care homes, uh, mostly in the East Midlands or like hospices in that particular region, uh, but I've also worked with the NHS on this particular project. So there's quite some history um, to this in the sense that um, trying so, you know, to understand dementia, not just from a clinical perspective, but mainly from a more uh, sociological or socio-psychological perspective. That also means that when we start to look at what is pain, we can actually see that these that clinical uh, understandings seem to dominate. So when we ask the question, what is pain? When we look at the definition for, uh, formulated by the International Association for the Study of Pain, the reads that it is considered as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So there are numbers of, you know, of um, issues sort of, you know, that um, come with this definition. In today's presentation, I will mainly focus on the part that I've highlighted here in bold. But to give a bit more context on this, it's, it's problematic in a sense because it already predefines pain always as an unpleasant state. But then, so if, you know, we find actually on we've seen in our research that people mentioned to us also, you know, pain in a sense of um, pleasure. So for instance, uh, we've done interviews with people you know, giving birth and there's the pleasure of giving birth. We also you know, talk to people working in sports and where pain is actually considered to be a kind of you know, positive or even motivating force. There's also you know, um, pains of, you know, associated with um, uh, sexual intercourse. So therefore, you know, we see that's like some certain problematic elements, but then also you know, we can see that it's related to, you know, tissue damage and so forth. So something sort of you know, about this definition says that it's about the body, right? And if sort of, you know, the body can almost, you know, in an objective or impartial way, tell the person who experienced that pain, what that pain is. So that is sort of, you know, very much the kind of, you know, clinical situation that we find here. But likewise, although sort of, you know, like clinical definitions seem to suggest um, that pain is something quite objective and can be measured is actually quite interesting when we then try to understand how can it be measured so if you know what so if you know what are the current procedures in this field what do they look like and it's quite interesting to understand you know despite the very clinical or medical definition that there's actually no clinical procedure to measure pain so there is for instance no procedure where like you know your neurological state could be measured, or I don't know, the flow sort of, you know, of um, electricity in your neurons, or sort of, you know, where they could, I don't know, do scans of your brain and all that. And that was sort of, you know, objectively tell that person is in a very severe state, or that person sort of, you know, is only experiencing very mild pain, or what kind of pain it is actually that's being felt. So there is, you know, in that sense, like actually no objective clinical measure to, to approach that. So what sort of you know, measures are then being used in it if that is not um, existing at the moment? The most common um, measure that is still being used and it's out there, the example I provide here is a very, very simplistic one, is the kind of uh, pain ratings or pain questionnaires. So when you look, so for instance, at pain questionnaires uh, as a kind of you know, more common tool used within uh, the NHS and other health providers, Usually these consist of a very large number of particular keywords, um, uh, often sort of, you know, related to metaphors, pains and needles and so forth, um, stitching, um, et cetera. So really sort of, you know, quite some complex vocabulary. And we looked sort of, you know, at a number of these pain questionnaires across different countries. So for instance, if you look at the most extensive one here in the UK, they consist of about 130 words, or we've seen others in the Netherlands or in the Arab world, it can easily be up to 200. So it's quite so, you know, a very large vocabulary if you see that that's being used in order to measure it. But then likewise, 
across sort of you know these vocabularies, we also find these ratings, right? Is it a seven? Is it an eight? Or so if you know is and then so if you know we find notions in terms of no pain or so if you know mild pain associated with this. However, when we looked and also at some of the research, we could actually find that these pain scares or pain questionnaires and so forth, they have proven to be highly unreliable. They have proven to be unreliable for a number of reasons. Um, for instance, it's very difficult to uh, rate a pain on one particular day in comparison to the day after. So we've seen so you know, people that you know, rated their pain on the day is six and then really struggled on the next day to compare that pain that they experienced on that day with the previous day. Um, also, you know, obviously with the keywords, um, there can be quite a different interpretation on their meanings and so forth. So all of that, so if you know, it's actually, when you think about it, pain being quite a subjective experience, but the kind of you know, problematic nature with these pain scales or pain questionnaires is, they kind of seem to suggest is something that is quite objective. However, so if you know what these pain questionnaires also tell us, and I think that's quite an important feature, and this is if you know where this research is really based on, is one particular aspect. Namely, in order for pain to be exist, it needs to be communicated. Yeah. So even sort of you know if you tick these boxes on the questionnaire and then discuss it with your with the pain nurse or with your GP or like your other sort of you know your pain specialist, it still sort of you know requires a moment of communication right some form of interaction between two people is needed so that's of you know pain in a sense as an as an object of that interaction can be constructed right so because it cannot be measured in any other way so it requires the kind of you know vocalization um, in which of you know these two parties in a sense negotiate and establish and what kind of pain or what that kind of you know pain experience is going to look like Like I said, you know, these questionnaires often sort of, you know, come with a considerable number of keywords. Uh, they're not easy to read. They're quite unreliable. And so in a sense, they're not already challenging for, um, so, you know, um, people that, um, so, you know, might uh, usually sort of, you know, experience pain. But they're, as we've seen with our research, they are even more so difficult for people with dementia. And that is simply because of, you know, as this kind of illness is progressing, it leads to a decline of linguistic capabilities. Linguistic capabilities in the sense that people find it a lot more challenging to vocalize themselves, but also to understand um, communication from others. So therefore this, you know, when you think about this interaction that I've mentioned, the whole communication that is actually necessary in order to establish uh, what the person's experience of pain is going to look like, is sort of, you know, um, severely constrained for people with dementia. And we see some quite severe uh, consequences um, of that challenge. So on the one hand, we can see because people are unable to um, vocalize it properly, right? So if, you know, they're unable to really sort of, you know, communicate. I mean, severe pain and what it looks like and describe it with kind of all the vocabulary that is necessary and kind of, you know, like then negotiate it with that other person in order to clarify what is going on here. We see on the one hand, it leads to an underestimated um, assessment of pain. And that is then often causing anxiety, aggression, or even depression, right? So because you feel sort of, you know, it's not being recognized, you're kind of, you know, dealing with this on your own and so forth. So quite so in severe con uh, consequences that come with this. But likewise, on the other hand, what we also see is the other extreme that it can be overestimated. Uh, people, so if you know, might, so if you know, only because they only be able to communicate it, let's say, maybe in a very basic way, that this, so if you know, might lead to the impression on the other side of the person that is quite severe, that's quite dramatic. So we see then actually far too much pain medication is being prescribed, people being nearly sedated. And these kind of, you know, nearly sedated states, which constrain people's daily behavior, what they can do is then actually accelerating the development of dementia. So we see sort of, you know, this kind of interactive nature and the kind of, you know, current measures are somewhat problematic because they can lead to quite severe consequences uh, for people experiencing uh, dementia. 
So therefore, we decided we need so, you know, to look a bit deeper and try to develop a new understanding of pain, a kind of new understanding of pain that is much more appropriate to the situation of, uh, for people with dementia, but then likewise also a kind of understanding of pain that brings out this more interactive nature much more clearly, right? So really, because we seem to think that this is very much the core where uh, the understanding and therefore sort of, you know, successful assessment and then treatment of pain resides. And we kind of sort of needed to get um, a better understanding conceptually, so you know, of this particular um, process. So therefore sort of, you know, what we wanted to do was conducting a participatory research with people with dementia in order to understand um, pain a lot better, which kind of, you know, seems obvious that we want to understand and involve people with dementia. It's still sort of, you know, within, dementia research, it's not a very common feature. Uh, and there are two reasons of, you know, why it isn't a very common feature or why it hasn't sort of, you know, yet reached that particular impact. So on the one hand, there is still an overall lack in terms of accessible methodologies. So methodologies that are um, understandable and are inclusive enough so that people with dementia really can make a contribution. So it's not just, you know, some sort of, you know, box ticking exercise. So often sort of, you know, what we even see is that some sort of, you know, intervention is being made and then a questionnaire is handed out often, so if you know, not to the people with dementia, but to their carers being, you know, professionally or their informal carers. So then they sort of, you know, in a sense, are then being asked to assess has that intervention made a difference to that particular person. So there's quite, so if you know, some emerging literature in this field that tries so if you know, to develop more accessible methodologies so that, people with dementia are really involved sort of, you know, in this kind of you know, research process very early on, and it's for them sort of you know, inclusive and accessible. The second element is also obviously, you know, when, we, when you do this kind of research, it involves academics, practitioners, carers, people with dementia, so quite a different number of people with different areas of expertise. And because of, you know, we find different areas of expertise and different areas of knowledge, we often see, so if you know, that when then there's kind of particip more participatory research is being organized, that is quite an unequal contribution of these uh, different parties. And reasons, so if you know, might be, so if you know, in terms of because the, the regarded status of a particular person, or so if you know, you feel maybe a bit intimidated by that situation, or maybe so if you know, not used, so if you know, to speaking in public and all that. So, so if you know, therefore, it can, it can create these um, and kind of asymmetrical relationships where, so if you know, then some, you know, contribute more than others. And again, so if you know, that's not ideal because often, so if you know, it's the people with dementia that um, lose out in such a situation and are unable to fully contribute to contribute. But, you know, we wanted to develop a definition for them and with them. And obviously, so if you know, if they kind of lose out, then the, the likelihood that the definition doesn't meet their needs um, is increased. So therefore, sort of, you know, some of these challenges were really important to us, um, something so, you know, that we tried to address in this research by importing a number of methodologies actually coming from the arts um, and so forth. I can't go into the details in today's presentation, but um, a number of, you know, um, more so, you know, creative methodologies were being imported from uh, the field of, you know, mu museum education, but also, so, you know, from the field of communication studies and also, you know, to reach and develop so, um, such more um, inclusive agendas. Okay. In terms of the results, so what is it that we try to you know, stress in terms of the results in this research? So first and foremost, it was quite important for us that we needed so, you know, to develop an understanding of the more interactive nature of the meaning making of pain in order so, to overcome the uh, narrow clinical understandings. So that was really like a key priority. We also wanted to provide a more nuanced approach to what pain means. Like I said, you know, earlier on, not just, you know, looking at pain from this kind of unpleasant perspective, but really sort of, you know, looking at from the greater variety of meanings. And then third, we also sort of, you know, then wanted, you know, with the, with the help of those people, try to understand non-list or non-linguistic channels uh, to interact for these people with in order so, you know, to express or maybe so, you know, better assess pain, which might so, you know, include, for instance, forms of music or you know, different kinds of technologies, certain apps and smart technologies and so forth. So that so, you know, was all part of what we tried to so, you know, address 
in, in that kind of research. In terms of the results, I will focus mainly on aspect one today, the kind of you know, uh, more uh, conceptual understanding. So we arrived sort of, you know, while doing sort of, you know, all that research, uh, this kind of participatory research at quite a sort of, maybe sort of, you know, um, comp uh, sort of, you know seemingly complex definition. Uh, but let me explain that in a bit more detail. So the understanding where we arrived is to say that pain is sort of, you know, not necessarily unpleasant or pleasant, but we said that pain is an interruption in the bodily related meaning making. So what does it mean? So usually sort of, you know, when we, go about ourselves then the body is kind of like a key reference in terms of who we are how we feel about the world so you know how we orient ourselves in the world and obviously you know the body is something that is part of a psychological environment so you know our minds and you know our histories and so you know our memories and so forth but likewise it's also something that is embedded in our social environment right and these interactions between Kind of like you know our sort of you know bodily identity, the environment, and sort of you know our personal history. It's really sort of you know something that kind of you know flows sort of you know quite naturally in our everyday. Something that we often sort of you know are not aware of when we go on about the day. But pain is something that is quite sort of you know um, doing almost like you know a good job in interrupting that sort of you know seemingly easy process, right? So if you know it kind of you know captures that this particular attention. So if you know we really sort of you know therefore struggle to make sense of, sort of you know, how this could potentially look like. So for instance, just to give two examples um, where from the interviewers so if you know, that uh, might illustrate this further. We had like one person in the, that we interviewed who said, yeah, well, that when this interruption occurs, right, then sort of, you know, the kind of pain then sort of, you know, means to this particular person that um, he can't provide for his family, right? So if you know, there's something in a sense, you know, of wrong sort of, you know, with, with sort of, you know, the world in a sense and everything around him because, you know, he's kind of, you know, falling short. So that kind of, you know, failure, right? So the kind of interruption signals failure to him and failure in the sense that he can't provide. On the other hand, so, if, you know, we had a very similar example where also, you know, someone then um, saw this interruption similar as a failure, but more as a failure towards himself that he may have become sort of, you know, um, baggage, you know, to the other people around him. So therefore, so if, you know, their interpretation of pain was actually quite different one. And you can see obviously, so if, you know, with the first person, the rating of pain will be a lot higher, will be much more severe and will be, so if, you know, much more on that person's mind because, you know, a lot depends on it, a lot, a lot, you know, depends on it. And we can, so if, you know, see that potentially, you know, the treatment of pain and so if, you know, providing of trains, so if, you know, will, so if, you know, like, um, you know, need to be quite early on and might so if, you know, even require higher levels of, pain medication rather right? the second person as long as sort of you know this person can go through their day and so you know still do so you know their daily activities even though so you know there might be some level of discomfort so if you know it might so you know not create these kind of you know spiraling problems um, as we've discussed earlier on so this is sort of you know at the kind of conceptual definition where we arrived and at the moment so you know we are continuing this research conducting some uh, so, you know, broader quantitative research and also, you know, to uh, collect, you know, further data on the understanding of pain, so, you know, within the broader medical sector and within, so, you know, the broader care setting. Thank you very much for listening to today's presentation. And if you have any further questions, um, uh, here's my email. So, you know, please feel free to send me any further questions or, so, you know, if you would like me to send you any research papers that were published on this. Um, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.